My name is Chris. I'm leading the TensorFlow Federated team in Seattle. And I'm here to tell you about Federated Learning and the platform we've built to support it. Uh, there are two parts of this talk. Um, first, I'll talk about Federated Learning, how it works and why, and then I'll switch to talk about the platform. All right, let's do it. Um, but this is a machine learning story, so it begins with data, of course. And today, the most exciting data out there is all born, born decentralized on billions of personal devices like cell phones. Um, all right, so how can we create intelligence and better products from data that's decentralized? Traditionally, what we do is that there's a server in the cloud um, that is hosting the machine learning model in TensorFlow, and clients all talk to it to make predictions on their behalf. And as they do, the client data accumulates on the server right next to the model. So model and data, it's all in one place. Very easy. We can use traditional techniques that we all know. Uh, and what's also great about this scenario is that the same model is exposed to data from all clients, and so, you know, potentially millions of clients, and so it's very efficient. Um, all right, if it's so good, um, why change that, right? Well, actually, in some applications, it's not so great. Um, first, it doesn't work offline. Um, there's high latency, so, you know, applications that need fast turnaround may, may not work. Um, all these network communications consuming battery life and bandwidth, and, and some data is too sensitive, so, so collecting is not an option, or too large, some sensor data could be large. All right, so, um, okay, what can we do? Uh, maybe we go to the complete other extreme. So, ditch the server in the cloud. Now, each client is its own client bubble, right? Um, it has its own TensorFlow runtime, its own model, and it's training, it's grinding over its data um, to, to, to train and doesn't communicate with anything. So now, of course, nothing leaves the device. None of the concerns from the preceding slide apply, uh, but we have other problems. Um, a single client just doesn't have enough data very often, that doesn't have enough data to create a good model on its own. Um, so okay, so this, this doesn't always work. Um, what if you bring the server back, but the clients are actually only receiving data from the server? Could that work? All right, so if you have some proxy data on the server that's similar to the on-device data, um, you could use it. You could pre-train the model on the server and then deploy it to clients and then let it potentially evolve further. Okay, so, so that could work. Um, except very often there, there's no uh, good proxy data or not enough of it to, uh, for the kinds of um, on-device data you're interested in. Um, a second problem is that um, this, this here, the intelligence we're creating is kind of frozen in time, right? Um, in a sense that, you know, as, as I mentioned, clients won't be able to do a whole lot on their own. Um, and why does it matter? And here's one concrete example that, from actually a production application. Because um, it's a smart keyboard that's trying to learn to autocomplete. If you train a model on the server and deploy it, now suddenly millions of people start using a new word, what happens? Uh, you'd think, hey, it's a strong signal, millions of people. But if you're not one of those millions, your phone has no clue, right? And you, it could take a lot of punching into that phone to, to make it notice that something new has happened, right? So, so yeah, this is, this is not um, uh, what we want. Um, we really need the clients to somehow contribute back towards the common good so they can all benefit. But data trailing is one way to do that. Here, we start with an initial model provided by the server. Um, this one is not pre-trained. We don't assume we have proxy data. It doesn't matter. It can be just zeros. Uh, so send it to a client. The client now trains it locally on its, on its own data. And this is more than just one step of gradient descent, but it's also not training to convergence. Typically, you just make a few passes over, over the data on the client, and then produce a locally trained model and send it to the server. Um, and now all the clients are training independently, but they all use the same initial model to start with. And server's job is to orchestrate this process to make it happen and produce the same, feed the same initial model to other clients. Um, so now, um, one of the ones that sort of collects the, the, the locally trained models from clients, it aggregates them into a so-called federated model. And typically, what, what we do is simply average the model parameters across all clients. So it's just, it's several just adds the numbers, and that's it. Um, OK. So this federated model, um, it has been influenced by data from all clients, right? Because it's been influenced by all the client models, and those in, the, in turn have been influenced by client data. So, so we do get those benefits of scale in this scenario, so that's great. But um, there's one concern, what happened to privacy? So let's look at this closely. Uh, first, client data never left the device, right? Only the models trained on this data were shared. Um, now the server, so next the server does not um, retain, store uh, any of the client models. 
it simply adds them up and then throws them away, deletes them, right? So, um, so, the, the, so they're ephemeral. Um, now here you'd ask, you know, how do you know that this, what the server is doing? Maybe the server is secretly somehow logging something on site, right? So there are cryptographic protocols that we can use to ensure that that's, you know, that's all legit. So this, the, with those protocols, the server will only see the final result of aggregation that will not have access to any of the um, individual client contributions. Uh, and we, we use those in practice, so hopefully to put your mind at rest. Um, so, okay, so the server only ever sees the final aggregate. You can still wonder how do we know that that doesn't concern anything sensitive. Um, so this is where, where you would use uh, differential privacy. Uh, in a nutshell, just each, each client clips its update uh, and uh, adds a little bit of noise. So once the final aggregate emerges of the server, there's enough noise to sort of mask out any of the individual contributions, but, but there's still enough signal to make progress. Um, so not, not to get too much into the detail, but we, this is also a, um, a technique we use in production. Differential privacy is, is an established and a commonly used way to provide uh, anonymity. Okay, um, uh, if you have any more concerns, I'll be happy to, to, to discuss them offline. Um, okay, so how does it work in practice? Uh, first, it's not enough to just do it once, right? So um, once you produce a federated model, you'll feed it back uh, on the server uh, as an initial model for the next round and execute many thousands of rounds, potentially, that's how long it takes to, to converge. Uh, and so in, in this scenario, both clients and servers have a role. Clients are doing all the learning, that's where all the machine learning uh, is, is, is sits. And server is just orchestrating the process, maybe you know, aggregating, and also providing continuity to this process as, as we move from one round to another. Server is what carries the state between rounds. And um, to drill into this a little bit more, um, in the practical applications, clients are not all available at the same, the same time. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you remember those concerns I mentioned um, about you know, consuming battery li and, uh, life and bandwidth. Um, we, we want to uh, give users a good experience, so we want it to be non-disruptive, so we will only perform training um, when the device is connected into the power source on a Wi-Fi network and idle so that you know, the user is not negatively affected. And so that means out of the billions of clients out there, only a small fraction are available at any given time for, for training. And this is illustrated on this diagram here. This is from an actual production system. Um, where you can kind of see when you, when you track the number of rounds per hour the server completes uh, across time. You can see kind of maxes out um, you know, at night when everyone's asleep and their phone is connected. Uh, and and you know, dips at lunch when everybody's punching on the, on, into the phone while eating. So yeah. Um, <clears throat> So the, the clients keep coming and going, and so that means that as we move uh, across rounds from one round to another, the set of uh, participating clients will change, uh, you know, um, for various reasons, including that, that uh, you know, so, some of them lose connectivity. So clients can, in general, drop out at any time. Um, so that's uh, so in, in an actual production system, when it's deployed, there's always um, a client selection phase where the, the exact num you know, set of participants is chosen. And, and there are many factors that go into it, including you know, concerns about bias. Um, but uh, you know, for this talk, all that, that's important to remember is that the, the, the set of clients in each round is different. Okay, um, so in, in, in a nutshell, the characteristics of a production scenarios, you know, clients, uh, there, there are many of them, millions, billions. Um, they don't, don't talk to each other. This is, these are cell phones, so no peer-to-peer -peer connectivity. Um, Everything is, you know, communication is the bottleneck in, this whole, in, the, in the whole system. Clients want to be anonymous, and for the, for the most part, they're interchangeable in the sense that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, whether a particular device contributed data or not, it doesn't really affect the, you know, result in any way. Um, and the clients are unreliable, and uh, they can drop on at any time. Therefore, we have to effectively consider them as stateless. Even if they have some memory, there's no guarantee when, the, when they'll be back. So we treat them as stateless little compute nodes. Uh, and finally, um, the distribution of data and clients is, is very non-uniform because, you know, people differ. Okay, um, so is it only for mobile devices? No, not at all. Um, you could use federated learning for things like, you know, a group of hospitals wanting to um, learn something together or a group of financial institutions. Um, so the, the, general, the general approach is the same. Like, of course, the details will differ a little bit. And in this case, you know, clients are very reliable, potentially very capable, um, but there are fewer of them. So, for example, some of the cryptographic protocols that we're using um, they, they work better when there are more clients. And so here you may have to work harder or, or use some more specialized variants. All right, so how well does it work in practice? Uh, we've deployed it at Google in, in several applications, including uh, the smart keyboard that I mentioned. Uh, so it runs in production on millions of devices. Um, and when you compare um, performance of, a, of a, an autocomplete model that, tries, that, that learns on federated data 
uh, it's clearly better, higher accuracy, more user clicks than the former, uh, the model trained on the server. Um, this is illustrated also on these diagrams here. And you can see on the right side, the federal model stabilizes at a better performance. And really, really the reason for that is that the on-device data is, you know, is, is, the, is the good data, the uh, higher quality data than the proxy data on the server. Um, also, I mentioned before that um, you know, non-federated models were, were limited in, in you know, they were not, wouldn't necessarily be able to adapt to changes in the environment and pick up changes over time. So, um, and so here we demonstrate the federated model can actually uh, learn new words that were not initially in the vocabulary and notice that the people are using them and include them. Um, it's, it's, it's worth pointing out, this is definitely one example of an uh, application that definitely want to use differ differential privacy to make sure that the only thing you're learning is common things and, and nothing sensitive gets through. Okay, um, so it worked at Google. Of course, the, what you really want to know is to, if it will work for your application. Uh, so some rife guidelines here, um, uh, so, you know, mostly common sense stuff, like um, if, if the on-device data is, is a higher quality or if it's sensitive or large, um, you know, good reason to use federated learning. Uh, of course, you also need the labels, right, for, for training. Um, and so uh, we, we can't pay someone to go and label the data, right, because it's on device. We can't, you know, access it. Um, so, so in some cases, uh, labels are just part of the data, like in the smart keyboard, you know, the, all the characters you're trying to predict, people will eventually type those characters. And so that's where the, the labels are. Uh, in some cases, you will have to work harder to, to you know, wire up additional signal into ap your application to, to have those labels. Okay. Um, you know, but other than that, it's, you know, federal is an area of active research. Um, uh, many variants, many extensions uh, <clears throat> exist in, you know, lots of publications, hundreds of uh, publications, um, several workshops just this year. One of them organized at Google. It's just a little picture of, you know, us in this workshop. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, it's not guaranteed that any particular of Kant's solution will immediately work for you. Uh, you have to just try things out and see what works. And, and what, you know, what we have to all collectively do to, to, um, to advance this, this area, um, this promising field, is to um, explore together. And so that's why we've built TensorFlow Federated. And so let's, let's get, get to it. All right. Um, so TensorFlow Federated, uh, what is it? Um, development environment that is designed specifically for federated learning, although it's also you know, uh, applicable to marginal uh, kinds of computations that I'll get to in a minute. Um, it provides um, a new programming language that's, uh, it's not in your face, it's embedded in Python, so you kind of don't, don't notice it, but there's actually kind of a programming language um, that combines TensorFlow and distributed communication. Uh, in that language, we have implemented a number of, a number of um, and, um, federated algorithms, um, and so we, we, we provide everything you need for simulations, and so the, the runtimes, data sets, and everything is there. Uh, it's for past, part of TensorFlow, and uh, it's on GitHub, so everything is open source, and and modifiable. Uh, okay, whom is it for? There are two main audiences. One is the researchers. Uh, here's what we want to um, uh, enable is, is for people to very quickly get started. And so uh, we provide uh, um, this pseudocode, like high level um, uh, language with pseudocode high level abstractions. And so, so that it's very easy for you to express your, your ideas in, in a way that's super compact and you can see you know, what you're doing. Um, also, a number of things you can copy, paste, and fork, and, and modify. So that includes the federated learning algorithm implementations, but also we will, um, it's still kind of emerging, but we'll have um, full end-to-end -end examples of research reproduced with scripts you can run and, and you know, modify and do whatever. Um, and data sets, and, and also the, the simulation infrastructure is, is designed to be modular so that uh, whatever kind of resources you, you might have, whether it's you know, a cluster in a basement or something else, you can configure things in such a way that works on your hardware. Um, the second uh, equally important audience is practitioners. And so we, we want to be able to take all the latest research and immediately use it in production, um, assuming that's all implemented in TFF. Hopefully that will happen. Um, and so we made a number of decisions to support that. One is that the, the, the language that I keep mentioning, um, the abstractions are designed in such a way that you know, we, we're thinking of production deployment from day one. Even though production deployment options are, were not something we provided on day one, but they've been on our minds from day one. Um, also, um, we designed the system in such a way that whatever code you're, 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 you're writing in TFF to, um, you know, to run in a simulation, you can take the same code without any changes, you can move into production. Um, I'll get to do it later. And also, the, the system is composable so that you, know, you can pick the things you want and compose them together and make it work. 
and modify uh, whatever you want using the pseudocode-like language because you know, the code is in a form that you, you should be able to actually read it and understand. And, and, and perhaps most, most importantly, we're actually eating our own dog food and using it at Google. So, so we, we are investing our resources to make sure the project evolves in such a way that, um, uh, in a way that's uh, relevant for production deployment. All right, so um, I keep mentioning a new language. Why, why do you need, need new language for the, for the data learning? Um, uh, the reason for that is that uh, for data programs are distributed, right? So they include clients and server and everything in between. Uh, so communication is essential, an essential part of the program. It's not just some systems concern that's, you know, second thought. Um, and so it is kind of expected that just, just as in TensorFlow, you know, you are expected to be engineering your model architectures and tinkering with models and, you know, add new operators here and there. Same with feathered layering, except now your, you know, your data flow di diagram kind of spans the entire network, right? And so obviously communication is also something that you should be able to engineer and play with. And we want to give you programming language abstractions that make it super easy to do that. And um, things like point-to-point -point messaging or you know, taking and restoring checkpoints, we've tried to use those. That's what our initial implementations of federated learning were like. We, it was unreadable. It was very, very difficult to, to work with. So we've designed a new system based on higher level abstractions as, as a basis. And hopefully you see how, how, how this is done in TFF and that, that you like it. Um, why stress portability between research and production? Um, you know, when we think about it, if you in, you know, in idealized, idealized federated learning environment, if you can't look at the data, a lot of things that we take for granted become more interesting. Like, you know, you can't just look at the data, so, so it may not be easy to see, you know, where the outliers are or debug problems with your predictions or trying out various models. There are still ways to do some of those things, but, you know, they're not, not obvious. Um, um, so, for, for example, you may want to just go ahead and deploy your model into a live system to run on real devices, maybe in dry mode, so nothing gets affected, but it kind of runs there and you can see how well it's doing and, 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 and iterate in this manner. So, so the kind of traditional boundary between you know, production versus research, all this gets a little bit more fuzzy. You, know, you sometimes may have to experiment in production. And so because of that and the, the general desire to transfer new research into production ASAP, uh, it's, it's, it's essential in our mind to, to, to provide this kind of portability. So you write one, one version of code and it works whether it's research or, or simulation or production, it's the same code. Uh, and a number of decisions in TFF reflect that, like the fact that everything is kind of language agnostic and platform agnostic and uh, everything is expressed declaratively so that you can compile it into different kind of execution environments. Okay, so uh, where do you start? Um, the basis of um, um, building problems in TFF is a federated computation. Um, this is a generalization of federated learning. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we, see, we have clients that have sensitive data. There are, you know, very many of them. Um, they, they do all the training, server orchestrates these computations and, you know, provides continuity over time. The clients want to be anonymous. So whatever operations we do on clients have to be in aggregate. That's in, in essence, uh, you know, what, what defines a federated computation. How do we create those? Um, so let's, let, now let's go through the, the various abstractions that we have in TFF one by one. Uh, values. Um, this is a set of clients. Let's say each of them has a temperature sensor that you know, produces some reading, let's say a floating point number. Um, we're going to refer to the collective of all those numbers as a single federated value. So a federated value can be a multi-set of those you know, individual uh, contrib co contributions from clients. Right? Um, <clears throat> these federated values have also federated types. In, um, in this case, it's going to float or float or federated floating clients. Um, the curly braces indicate that it's a multi-set. Uh, <clears throat> in general, type consists of the type of the individual constituents and, and, and what we call a placement, which is essentially an identity of the, the group of system participants. We have a little placement algebra in TFF. I won't get into it, but you know, the, for starters, you, you would only use clients and server as, as, as the ones. Um, now, so, suppose you have a server and there's a number on the server. Let's say it's also you know, some, some float. Um, we can also call it a federated value in this case. Um, it's not a multi-set because there's just one, one sample of it. Um, so it's a float on the server. Now let's get to operators. Um, suppose there is a distributed aggregation protocol that is picking up numbers from the clients and depositing, let's say, the average or something like that on the server, right? Um, so uh, unlike in a, in a programming language like Python, here in TFF, you can think of it as a function. Uh, in this case, the inputs to that function are in different places than the output, but that's okay because TFF <coughs> is essentially a programming framework for creating distributed systems. And this is a little distributed system. Um, and so uh, you can, um, 
uh, model this as a function, in, in, in fact, and you can even give it a functional type, and this function um, takes a float on clients and produces a float on server. <coughs> uh, in TFF, we also have a little library of, of you know, commonly used functions, like for example, federated mean will take um, a federated float on clients and, and produce the average of those on the server. And others are available. Now, with all that I've introduced, uh, you can essentially start writing programs. So let's write a very, very simple, essentially the simplest possible uh, federated computation. Uh, it goes like this. Uh, first, TFF is a strongly typed programming language, and so you always start by defining the types of things. And I mentioned we have the federated flow on clients, and so there it goes. Next, you're going to actually write a computation. And so um, TFF code is not Python code, um, but you express it in Python. And it, you know, it's, it's really the, the same idea as, as what you have in TensorFlow, right? In TensorFlow, TensorFlow code is not Python code. It's TensorFlow. Uh, these are TensorFlow things that are executed by TensorFlow runtime, but you can express them in Python, right? The Python is the language in which you construct them. It's the, the same idea here, right? So uh, you, you write a little Python function, you decorate it as a so-called federated computation, you specify the, the federated type of the input. Now in the body of this Python function, <coughs> the sensor readings parameter uh, represents the, um, the, the, no, no, the federated uh, uh, flow that came out as the input, and now we can use federated operations TFF to, to slice and dice um, th that, uh, that value. Uh, in this case, we just call the federated mean and, and that's it, we return. Okay, so now <clears throat> what happens here is that, just as in TensorFlow, the Python function gets traced and um, we, co uh, we construct a little TensorFlow computation representation in a serialized form and store it underneath that symbol. It's kind of again, the same idea of the TF function getting traced and you know, TensorFlow graph getting stored uh, in a serialized form behind. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's what happens. So, so when I say that TFF programs are not Python, that's, that's, that's what it means. The get average temperature now, symbol now represents uh, a serialized representation of, of a code in TFF. Okay, um, and, and the reason that's important be, because uh, Again, we, we want to run those things on devices, and so they, they're not going to be interpreted by a regular Python. Okay, so now let's look at something slightly larger. Let's say we have the set of uh, clients. Um, <clears throat> each of them has a temperature sensor, and the analyst on the server wants to know what fraction of the clients have temperatures reading over some threshold, right? So I have two inputs here, the, the, the you know, red and blue. <clears throat> data is sensitive, we can't collect it, and so what we do instead, we use a federated broadcast operator to move the threshold from the server to the clients. Now that every client has both threshold and its own reading, and they can compare it, run a little block of TensorFlow to produce one it's, if it's over the threshold and zero otherwise. Um, and so you can think of this as, you know, like a map step in map radius. And we provide a federated map operator for those kinds of things as well. Um, and finally, so what emerges is a federated float comp composed of ones and zeros, which you can um, uh, feed as an input to the federated mean operator and, and produce the final ratio on the server. So that's it. That's the whole program in a diagram form. Uh, now, if you want to write code, you, it kind of looks the same, except it, you know, it's code. Um, so <clears throat> you start by defining a Python function, decorate it as a TFF computation. Um, you specify... Um, all the um, inputs as formal parameters, and so you see the readings input, these are the, the, the you know, temperatures, the threshold on the server. Uh, the inputs can be on uh, anywhere, whether it's clients on server, just, just you know, list all of them here. And now in the body of this function, you can again use the federated operators to slice and dice those things. Um, so you see the broadcast here again, you see the map and mean, and, and so on. Um, the, <clears throat> the, the, Clients are processing, I mentioned it was in TensorFlow, and so in this case, the parameter to the map function that, that represents this, this uh, processing is implemented in ordinary TensorFlow code. And that's it, you just, you just slap the types on top of it to make sure that everything is strong, strongly typed, uh, because TFF likes things to be strongly typed and, and, um, and will type, type check for you. And, and that's it, that's the whole program, you can go and run it. And um, <clears throat> I think we have a version of this in the tutorial as well. Okay, so now let's, let's uh, we're on a roll, let's, let's um, try for the training. Um, and I'm going to show just a small example of, of what we have described in a, in a tutorial um, on the, on the TensorFlow.org website. And I'm going to focus just on the computation that represents a single round of federated averaging, just like 
what we have discussed at the very beginning of this presentation. Okay, so, so this computation takes three parameters. There's a model on the server that the server wants to feed to the clients. There's a learning rate, which, no, let's make it interesting. Um, <clears throat> and there's a set of on-device data. Okay, um, so the first thing we'll do is, just as before, we broadcast the model and the learning rate from the server to the clients. Now that the clients have everything, model, learning rate, and their own slice of data, they can perform the client-side training. And likewise, like in the preceding example, we use the ferret map operator for that. And the local trade function would be uh, another computation, presumably implemented in TensorFlow, that I won't show. You know, it, it would look as it always does. Um, and finally, so, so, so the map function produces a set of client-side models, locally trained models, right? And now we just call the ferret mean operator to average them out. Um, you can apply that operator to any kind of value, including structured values. And so, so yeah, that's it. Um, the, uh, the output is the average of client-side models, and that's what um, that's the algorithm that we had. Um, yeah, and so that, that's the whole program. And and so the the version of it in the tutorial is you can see that it actually runs and works. Okay. Um, so this was of course a very simplified example how we can you know start extending it and, and make it more interesting. Um, just just two very 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 short examples I'm going to show. Uh, one common thing to do is um, uh, wanting to um, inject compression in various places to, to address various kinds of uh, systems uh, concerns. And so, for example, if you want to encode um, and <clears throat> compress data during broadcast, you can apply um, um, encoding on the server before you broadcast and then use a federated map function to decode on the clients after broadcast. And so you can see how basically you know, two lines of code get you what you want with the decode and encode presumably being implemented in TensorFlow. Uh, second example, if you want differential privacy, uh, very easy. Before, before you call federated mean to average your values, uh, you just uh, um, call a federated map operator to the, to the, you know, to the arguments uh, to add some clipping and, uh, and noise. Um, that I'm, I'm representing here symbolically, but that's what something that you would you know, normally just write in terms of flow. So again, a one-liner change uh, for a change like this. Uh, <clears throat> and yeah, and, and uh, you, you, can, you can sort of imagine other modifications you can, you can do like this. Okay, um, so how can you run it? Uh, even though I mentioned uh, uh, TFF code is not Python, you can call it in Python like a function, um, and, it, and it runs in Python. What happens is under the hood, we spawn a little runtime, for TFF and run a simulation there and return the number is in Python, so it's on scan log or works seamlessly as, it, as if it were Python. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, if you let's say want to run five, five runs on training, this is how you how write it. It's just kind of what you would expect. And the full version of it is again in the tutorial. So you just call the, call the computation and get the numbers part back. Uh, <clears throat> and, the, and the model is represented as a NumPy structure. Um, okay. Um, where do you get data for simulations? Um, uh, you can, of course, make your own, but we also provide a couple data sets and, 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 and many more on the way in the TFF simulations data sets uh, module. Um, each of these has a load data function. When you call it, you get a pair of Python objects that represent train and test data, and these objects uh, uh, allow you to inspect them. Now, I mentioned before, TFF computations don't let you deal with individual clients or the IDs. So this is, um, you know, things like inspecting what, what clients are in my data set. That's something that you can only do when uh, orchestrating your simulation in Python. You cannot do it in TFF for, you know, privacy reasons. Um, so in this case, you can, you can look at the, the client IDs, for example, so that you can, um, so you can simulate what I discussed previously, the client selection, right? So here you're taking all the client IDs, picking a random sample of them. Those are my clients for this round. And now um, I call that the, the trainer object to construct a TF data data set. This is an eager data set in, in TensorFlow for that particular client and you know, apply whatever pre post-processing you want, uh, pre-processing you want um, using the regular TF data APIs. And once you, uh, you, know, you collect, create a list of those, those are, those are my clients, those, those are my data sets, you can feed it as an argument into the computation just as I've shown before and, and, and you know, continue to flesh out your little Python loop. So it's, it's very easy, very natural to do. Um, okay, if you don't want to <coughs> implement anything from scratch, as, as, as we sort of did in this tutorial, <coughs> you might use one of the CAND APIs, like the tff.learning module. 
Um, so for example, here's, here's one uh, you know, function that constructs uh, um, uh, federated uh, training computations. Um, it's easiest to use with Keras. If you have a Keras model, we don't, you don't have to use Keras, but it's, it's much easier if you do. Um, so if you have a Keras model, you just kind of one-liner function to convert it into a form that TFF can absorb. And, and then um, these one-liner calls here, shown here take that model and construct computations that you can use for training and evaluation. Um, and you use them in the same way as, as the, 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 you know, you, you'll write little Python loops as, as those that you've seen before. So the train object has an, an initialized computation, has a pair of computations. Train initialized creates a <clears throat> state on the server, the initialized state for the first round. And then the, the next uh, uh, computation uh, represents a single round of training. So it will take the initial state before the round started and produce a new state. Uh, after the round completed. And that state includes the model as well as uh, various kinds of counters and things like that. And yeah, and in, in each round, as you, as you saw before, we, we can perform client selection and simulate you know, various kinds of system behavior and things like that. Yeah, so, so it's, it's very easy to use. And same for evaluation. You can take that final state after training, extract the model out of it and feed it to the evaluation computation. So the eval is a computation. Again, you just call it like a Python function and that gets you the metrics back and things like this. Okay, um, um, so yes, this by default all, when you, when you just invoke computations like functions as, as, as I've shown, it kind of all just runs on your machine in, 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 in your process. There are various ways to speed it up. Uh, we provide a whole, whole, whole framework for constructing simulation runtimes. <clears throat> there, there's right now, there's a one sort of a, you know, ready to use solution if you want to run multi-threaded simulations, um, in, in this snippet of code that, that I'm showing here, you can, you know, with, with one line, you create a local executor that has multiple threads in it and, and then make it the default and then whatever you type will run in that. So to, you know, um, if, if you want something more powerful, um, not, sh not long from now, we'll, we'll have a kind of all-inclusive, you know, ready-to-use solution for um, running things on Google Cloud and Kubernetes. Uh, in a multi-machine setting. Uh, if you don't want to wait for that, the, the, you can actually be, just go and stitch it up yourself because all the components are basically there in, in that uh, tff.framework namespace and those include various kinds of little executors you can stack up together in the executor stack that uh, you, um, you, you can use to construct the various multi-machine architectures with multiple tiers of aggregation, support for GPUs and things like that. And, um, and uh, it's designed to be extensible so that people can plug in various kinds of components to it. Um, now, if you want to go beyond just running simulations, uh, it is also possible. Um, <clears throat> um, for that, um, the, the, the options are still emerging, but, but the two that are already exist are on the table. Uh, may, may involve a little bit of effort, but you know, they're possible. One is you can actually pl plug in your physical devices into the simulation framework. So, uh, for example, you can, you can implement a, a simple gRPC backend, backend interface that we supply, uh, you know, say to run on your Arduino device or something. And then you can, you can plot that as a, as a little worker node uh, into a simulation framework, and now you can run on your physical devices. Um, of course, that's not something you'd use for a you know, large-scale production setting, but it's certainly doable for small, smaller scale experiments. Um, and also, we, we have an emerging set of compiler tools that take TFF computations and and transform them into a, a, a form that's more amenable for execution in a particular kind of backend. So for example, there's a, there's a, there's a body of code emerging that supports MapReduce like systems um, <clears throat> that takes computations and makes them look like MapReduces so that we can run it on you know, Hadoop or something. It's not, um, it's usable, not quite um, finished, but so somewhat usable if you're interested in pursuing uh, either of those options, I'd be happy to discuss offline. And more deployment options on the way, I can't really talk about them, but um, yeah, stay tuned for updates. Um, okay, if, if you need something that we haven't provided, um, this is um, intended to be an open framework and a community project. So um, by all means, please contribute, just you know, implement it and send out a people request and, and uh, so that everyone can benefit. Um, there are many ways you can contribute. You can, <clears throat> if you're a modeler, you can contribute models and, and data sets and things like that. 
uh, if you're interested in machine learning, so federated learning algorithms, you can contribute algorithms to the framework and, or, or, or help us you know, re-architect it to make it you know, easier to use. Uh, contribute core abstractions. Also, you know, new types of backends. Um, as I mentioned, this backend support for, for actually deploying things is emerging. And if you have any ideas, um, perhaps you can contribute to the TFF. All right, that's all I have. Thank you very much. So um, yeah, the qu two questions are um, when clients start learning and on their own data, and then do you have an averaged model on the server? Do you ever send the average model back to the clients for like performance boost, or do clients just spin off on their own afterwards? Um, and then the second question is how do you start the model? Do you use proxy data initially, and how do you iterate with your model's accuracy and things like that? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> for the first question, uh, in, in a system we have running in production, the, the way it works, and that's, that's kind of, that's different from TFF, that's just a deployed platform, right? And so there are many ways you can engineer this, but just talking about the particular example of a production system, the clients periodically come back to the server. So every, every time clients gets involved in a new round of training, they automatically get that new model. So that, that's one way you can arrange for this to happen. Uh, that's probably the easiest. Um, um, so you're kind of contributing as well as benefiting by getting the latest. Um, and the, the other question was, how do you get started on, on, on building models? And so if you do have proxy data and, and you think it's useful, then you know, it certainly helps um, to, to, to play with it. At least you can get some idea of what model architectures are, 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 are good. Um, you know, you, you can never be sure because proxy data is, you know, only so good. And since you never looked at the on-device data, you never really know for sure how good your proxy data might be, right? So the so 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 you might use proxy data, but but you might also choose not to, right? You could simply, you know, um, try different model architectures, deploy them on devices in in like as I mentioned, dry mode. So they would be kind of running on devices and getting evaluated, but not um, affecting anything other than consuming a little bit of resources. Uh, you could, you know, you could deploy hundreds of those at the same time on different subsets of the clients and see, okay, which are the most promising. That second route would be more of a, you know, pure approach that, that applies to any kind of on-device data, including when you have absolutely no idea how, to, you know, where, where to get proxy data, like, you know, some weird sensor data might, might look like that. Uh, yeah, and both, both are possible. And, you know. um. So the uh, first question I have is, does the uh, TF, uh, TFF library, does it integrate with uh, TF Lite? And the second question I have is, since it's language uh, platform agnostic, are you able to use it in non-Python? Uh, and you know, it, can I use it in the language that's not Python? Yeah. OK, let me start from the second one. So, so TFF computations are not Python. The, the, there's a, I think I had it linked on the slide. Even now I can follow up later. I, um, there's a, a protocol buffer definition that describes what a TFF computation is, and it's it's you know it's a data structure that has absolutely no no relationship to Python. Um, so yeah, you could you could take it and you could execute it um, in a completely different environment that has nothing to do with Python. Um, and um, TensorFlow code in inside of that computation is represented uh, as graph devs, TensorFlow graph devs. So if you were to run it on a different kind of TensorFlow runtime. To the extent you can take those graph devs and convert them for that other runtime, you know, maybe converting the ops or whatever, and that's also an option. Uh, so TFF itself doesn't integrate with TF Lite because um, <clears throat> TFF itself uh, is, does does not include a platform for on-device execution. TFF is more like a, the best thing of it to, to think of it is more like a compiler framework and a dev environment. Um, but yes, you could use it with your flight. So you know, you, you could um, define your computations, and you know, maybe apply some conversion tools to convert all the TensorFlow code in those computations into a form that TF Lite can can absorb, and then um, you know, arrange for for it to be executed. Thank you.
There's one. Uh, yeah. uh, good talk, thank you. I, I had a couple of questions. Um, so uh, does the client, do the, the, the models train until convergence? So I said again, clients? Uh, on the, the clients, do they train until convergence? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, do they or? No, no. Uh, no okay. Typically, you'd make a few passes over the client data set because you don't have to train for convergence. You're going to you're gonna run, you know, 10,000 rounds uh -huh. anyway. So it doesn't yeah, matter. And, yeah. and when, the, when the average model doesn't have access to the data, how do you measure its performance and how do you know it's good enough to now deploy, send it back to all the clients? If, sorry, if average model is... Uh, so the average model is on, on your local server, right? On, it's, yeah. And then you don't have access to the data. Oh, how yeah, do you, so how I, do you I, measure the performance of the average model? And yeah. how do you know when to deploy that model back? Yeah, so, um, so I did not describe federated evaluation, but you, it basically it's like the temperature sensor example, right? You, you can take that model, broadcast it to the clients. Uh -huh. Now the clients have the model and the data. They can evaluate each produces you know some whatever accuracy metric, average those those out or you know computer distribution and there you go. So federated evaluation is is kind of the same idea, just simpler. Okay, and uh, yeah. an, another question was: Is is there a way in uh, the federated learning intensive flow where you can uh, share parts of the? Uh, for example, the clients have sure, sorry share what? So the, the so the clients have uh, different labels, assuming, but they have similar data. Is there? A mechanism where you can say uh, the clients share most of the model, but they have their own uh, couple of layers for them. Maybe the last layer for the network is uh, specific to the client, but not shared across clients. Or is the entire does the entire model have to be shared across all the clients? Um, yeah, it's it's not a capability that we included mm -hmm. at the moment, but um, it sounds like conceivably something we could do uh, if you. Yeah, maybe you can follow up offline, and maybe you can, you can contribute. And yeah, thanks. Hey, uh, so um, one question that I had was that, like, when you kind of aggregate all of these models into a central server, um, it seems like it seems like one of the problems that federated learning solves is, I guess, distributing computation. Um, but when you get to like a million people using the Google keyboard, or a lot more actually, it seems like either the server is going to have to reject some gradient computations, or there's some hierarchical aggregation system where you kind of like aggregate the models upstream or whatever. Um, so I'm wondering if 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 the second is true. Uh, are there latency issues with gradients reaching the central model like after like by the time that the models change so much that it might corrupt it a little bit? So a couple of things. Uh, first, um, we, this is not the same as gradient descent in the sense that each client does a whole bunch of you know, um, computation, right? It trains on, on, you know, for, for a while. So what we said, what clients send to the server are not, not gradients, they're updates, differences between trained models and initial models that oh. include a whole bunch of client side training. Just, that's just one thing. The second one, uh, with respect to um, which clients have to uh, participate in computation, so not all clients. If you say have, I don't know, a million clients, uh, you could pick, you know, thousand client samples and First, it, you know, first train uh, may make an iteration of the model on the first thousand clients, then make an iteration on another thousand clients, right? You don't have to include all the clients at once. You know, really, the, the only thing that matters is that eventually most clients participate, so that most clients have a chance to influence the model, um, the, the training process at some point. But they don't have to simultaneously be present. Uh, um, but with respect to hierarchical aggregations, that's also true. So. Uh, the, both are both are, both are true, right? We do um, um, you you do have hierarchical aggregations in the, in, the, in the error system because you know you don't want a single server to be talking to ten thousand machines, but you also don't have um, to include the entire population in trend. I think I answered all of them, but okay. All right, thank you.